All right, I have started the recording and uh, we have a very broad audience, I see. So without any more time to lose, I think we can, uh, we can start. So uh, today's webinar, as um, shared in the invitation email, uh, we did a uh, research and uh, wrote a report together with a chest and we shared with all of you the links to the report and the advocacy brief that came out of it. So today we want to discuss our findings. I will start by presenting our methodology and key findings of this research. And then uh, Robert Odedo from a chest is going to present our main policy recommendations for at the national level for the Uganda context. And uh, he will also inform us about uh, the activities that we have taken um, up so far and the launch of the report in Kampala that happened in the beginning of this year. And after that, we will have, as I said, around half an hour, 25 minutes for your questions and uh, your comments. So let's start. So um, I'm starting with a number very familiar to everybody. So that's uh, the need for health workers per thousand population at 4.45 as defined by, by the WHO. And this brings the global need uh, for health workers to 40 million and the shortfall for uh, health workers by 2030 to 18 million. Um, in our uh, research, uh, we want to place uh, the HRH situation in Uganda in a broader global context. So this is why we are using these numbers. However, um, we already know that for a country specific context, this number is not always the most representative because it includes only nurses, midwives and doctors, whereas uh, the allied cadres of health professionals are also very relevant for the Ugandan context and for other country contexts as well. But we used it only when we had to do inter-country comparisons and comparisons with, uh, with a global context. So in this projected gap of 18 million health workers by 2030, uh, we identified as a um, low investment in the health workforce training, recruitment, deployment, and retention as the most critical factor for, uh, for the shortage and the key challenge for all countries to, to come over. Uh, the idea of uh, this research and this report came after a first report that uh, Vemos did with AMAMI, the, Malai um, the Association of Malawian Midwives, as part of the Health Systems Advocacy Partnership that we are all under. So we saw that uh, that was a very useful exercise and we repeated that with a chest uh, for Uganda. But in this case, we really looked broader at the financing of human resources for health, and we also incorporate it in the global context. The study objectives, so the main objective was to analyze the current status of the fiscal space for the health workforce financing in Uganda. And we wanted to evaluate the policy environment with regards to, to human resources for health to analyze the status, the trends, the financing mechanisms, and the management practices for HRH in Uganda, and to explore macroeconomic policies, conditions, and policy advice from external actors that also influences the country's resource envelope for health in general, and for the health workforce in particular. So you will see throughout uh, our report and uh, from the webinar today, that we are not always talking about HRH financing specifically, but sometimes we look more broadly to the health financing for the country. Uh, the scope of the study is uh, the public health sector. We are very much aware that the private health sector also plays a major role in Uganda, as well as in other countries as well. 
but at this stage we really wanted to focus at the public health sector so all the data that we used all the um, uh, the findings that you will see is around that so how did we how did we do that we started with a literature review using uh, sev uh, using numerous uh, sources of information that we could find in the public domain so from the Ugandan Ministry of Health, audit reports, development plans, uh, the health financing strategy, HRH strategies, and national health accounts. We also used uh, budget plans from the Ministry of Finance. We based our uh, statistics, uh, statistics data on the Uganda Bureau of Statistics. We also used WHO data uh, data especially for inter-country comparisons we investigated imf policy advice uh, because as i said we also wanted to investigate the external influence to the country and we also examined uh, gray literature uh, and academic literature from uh, universities but also from cso's that are working on similar uh, topics and uh, besides that, uh, we also talked with people, with stakeholders that had knowledge on the, um, on the topic of HRH financing. Uh, we talked with uh, government representatives from several ministries and commissions, with CSOs that are working on, uh, on HRH and health financing, also with um, professional, uh, health professional associations, and also we, on, we also wanted to examine the donor environment, so we, we talked with them as well. And with all the information that we gathered, we proceeded to the analysis, consolidation of findings, and uh, we drafted our policy recommendations that you will see uh, later on. So we did this together with, uh, between Demos and Achest, as I said. And I'm going to present you some of our key findings. Of course, the full report is available, but I want to focus on, 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 on the ones that we consider more, most crucial. So, uh, as I said, we examined the trends of um, or filling the staffing uh, norms in Uganda, and we have seen an increase in the, um, in the staffing throughout the years, at least the last uh, decade. Still, the tar we are below the targets of the health sector development plans, but there is increase percentage-wise in the staffing levels. What was interesting, though, was to see that even though percentage-wise we are increasing the staffing status of health professionals, if we look at the, um, at the ratios, how that um, reflects on the population, we have a completely different picture. So here on this slide, you see few of the cadres that we examined, and we see that in absolute numbers, indeed, doctors, clinical officers, midwives, and nurses increase, but we see that the ratio per thousand population is not really improving. And um, we noticed that the staffing norms have not ha uh, that we are talking about were established in 1999. The population of Uganda at that point was half of today's. So even though Uganda recruits more in the public sector, that not follows the population growth, which is very, very high in the last years. So that was a very interesting finding for us. Again, we are talking about the public sector only in these numbers and these ratios. And the paradox in this uh, situation that we noticed was that there is a large pool of qualified health professionals licensed and ready to, to get into the labor market, but they are not recruited. So then they start to either uh, leave the country or leave the sector, or stay unemployed. And we calculated that if this large pool, uh, large pool of health professionals would be absorbed in the public health sector, then the ratio per thousand inhabitants will, would really rise from 0 0.6 to 
per thousand inhabitants. Talking about doctors, nurses, and midwives only. But sti it, it would still be lower than the WHO threshold that we mentioned before, but it would be a very uh, significant improvement. But what is happening with the wage bill situation in Uganda? So we, we studied the, the budgets and the budget allocation for the last couple of years. And uh, we saw that when it comes to health worker salaries, uh, the wage bill saw an increase from 2017 to 2018. But the new uh, wage bill for, the, for this year didn't increase at all. Despite there was a population growth, despite the outdating staffing norms that I described before, and despite the growing burden of disease in the country. And even if the wage bill did not um, increase, there was also a large part of unspent uh, money that were returned to the Treasury for the year 2018-19, which shows a lot about the, the management of resources when it comes to, to human resources for health. Oops. So uh, what we found very interesting to do also in this report is to compare, to see uh, the overall health financing status in Uganda. So uh, for this reason, we looked into the WHO database as well, and we noticed um, a decrease in the current health expenditure per capita. In, uh, in US dollars the last, uh, the last 10 years uh, from all sources. So from domestic government, from uh, uh, domestic private sources and also the external health expenditure. And we also wanted to compare the current health expenditure of Uganda with neighboring countries that are also countries that uh, Vemos and NHS is uh, working with. And um, you can see the numbers of your screen, but we found very interesting that the government part of the total health expenditure is, uh, is very, very low in Uganda. In fact, it's, uh, it's the lowest in the, in the region. Let me change the slide. Yes. So um, in relation to prioritizing health, then we wanted to see how much uh, the government spends on the health sector uh, comparing to uh, as a percentage of the GDP and as a percentage of the total general government expenditure. And we saw a downward trends in both indicators in the last years. And Uganda has a, a growing GDP during the years examined, but the public sector, as we see, has not been able to attract a share of these additional resources. And, um, and here comes the question of, of course, who is taking the highest share of resources? And we compare the health sector with other sectors as well, such as uh, oil and infrastructure, agriculture, education, and we saw that uh, sectors such as infrastructure and um, oil and gas are way more uh, prioritized comparing to health. In this slide, I want to show you one of our findings when we examined what is happening with the external resources for health in Uganda. So as you can see, there has been a very sharp increase comparing to 10, 13 years ago in the external health expenditure, so usually grants coming from abroad. Uh, and now the health sector is really, really dependent on that. We are talking about 40 to 42% of the, of the current health expenditure. But what we were wondering with the colleagues is how much of this can go to health worker salaries? And we saw that there are donors that are reluctant to fund health worker salaries. And what's the status of sector-wide approach in the country? Because there has been ideas of pooling of resources in the health financing strategy of Uganda, namely the joint action fund idea. And I will show you here how it looks from the national health financing strategy. So basically, I'm not going to go into detail, but you see that the idea is to bring sources 
domestic and external together, as well as national health insurance um, resources to, be, to join a joint action um, fund. And that would lead eventually to a one health fund that would, would include everything. So, um, so this is a discussion about pooling. And of course, we saw that even if uh, Uganda prioritizes um, health spending um, in relation to the GDP, in relation to the government health, to the government overall expenditure, we are still far from filling the gap. And we started thinking, okay, when we talk about mobilizing more resources, there must be resources that are being uh, lost. And that brought us to examining more the illicit financial flows from the country. And uh, we saw here, I have some numbers also globally, but African-wise. But we saw that Uganda lost in uh, 2018, $547 million from illicit financial flows, whereas the health budget was almost half of that money. So this is how we try to place the discussion in the frame of, uh, of tax justice, but globally. And this brings me to, to some of my last slides. Uh, so here you see uh, a table. I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, what I want to highlight here is that when we did this, uh, this research and this report, uh, we wanted to examine different areas of uh, fiscal space uh, and different sources of um, revenues that could be mobilized for the health and for the health workforce in particular. And here we have identified some opportunities and some challenges per uh, fiscal space source. You can find all this in the, in the report. I'm not going to go into detail. I just want to show you the overview that we did and to highlight that all these are entry points for uh, advocacy for more fiscal space for health and fiscal space for human resources for health in particular. Not only for us, but for other CSOs as well that are working on, um, on the issue. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to conclude this part of uh, presenting you the main findings. And I'm going to uh, give the floor now to Robert Odedo from uh, Achest uh, to present you the recommendations that we came up with for, uh, for the government. Robert, over to you. Thanks, uh, Miriam. Um... So against uh, the analysis uh, of the findings that uh, Miriam has just shared, we have uh, recommendations uh, for consideration at uh, the various levels. Um, as uh, Miriam highlighted um, in the report, the issue of uh, staffing norms in uh, the health sector has not been addressed um, adequately over the years. In fact, um, the norms uh, that are presently being used were approved way back in 1999. And uh, as you all appreciate, uh, the population has uh, nearly doubled since then. Um, so we do recommend um, that uh, the Ministry of Health um, in Uganda, together with uh, stakeholders, uh, look into this issue seriously. We need to have the norms uh, updated of the health sector. Um, and this should ideally take into consideration the population growth, uh, the disease burden over the years has not only grown but changed. Uh, we see different patterns, um, with even emerging uh, diseases coming on board. And also, we need to look and take into consideration at uh, internationally agreed uh, standards. Um, the Human Resources for Health strategic uh, plan um, is currently being reviewed for the next uh, planning uh, uh, cycle and uh, we recommend that the issue of uh, staffing norms be prioritized during this process. Um, 
we now turn to strengthening health workforce planning um, and management. And here we see that uh, uh, utilization of accurate and reliable uh, standardized data is uh, an issue at all levels, uh, national and uh, sub-national, and there's need uh, to have clear actions that address this because without um, robust data sources and systems, um, we are unable uh, to have a proper functioning of uh, the system. So we recommend that uh, the training of health professionals should be, first of all, adjusted to address uh, the cadres that have got the highest uh, shortages. Um, in the analysis in the main report, um, you get a feel of uh, where these shortages are. And, uh, and we're saying that uh, training should speak to the needs uh, that we see in the stock. Um, and that, uh, secondly, Uganda should establish uh, the WHO recommended uh, CCA for Country Coordination Facilitation Mechanism. And this is a mechanism that brings together uh, various stakeholders, uh, relevant ministries and sectors, including health, education, local government, the public service, uh, finance, uh, a lot is around issues of finance. And so uh, it's important to have this uh, key sector in the picture as uh, the planning and forecasting for the country's uh, health professional needs are being uh, considered. And the government should also consider um, the timely disbursement of resources to the ministry. This has been uh, an issue with resources being uh, dispersed in a manner that does not uh, enable the timely implementation. As you can see in uh, the presentation, we had 16, uh, 16 billion Uganda shillings being unspent uh, in the financial year 2018-2019. Um, and all this has got to do with timely disbursement of uh, resources. So this will help the fresh recruitment of trained and currently unemployed um, health workers to be done in a timely manner. Um, the issue of uh, resource, uh, domestic uh, mobilization of resources uh, cannot be overemphasized. We see that the current investment in health is way below the WHO recommended levels. And uh, this of course does filter through in uh, the, the quality of services that are being uh, provided that are on offer and uh, uh, impedance of the capacity to recruit, retain, and develop human resources for health. And the action here is that government should uh, reverse uh, the trend, the negative trend that we saw, the declining per capita expenditure on health by uh, uh, looking at the target of 5% uh, GDP, allocation of 5% GDP uh, to health. As you can see, if, as you could see in the graph, graphs that were shown, we are uh, way below this uh, target. Um, now comes the issue of uh, health insurance, which is quite topical in Uganda right now. Um, in the report, the details in the report, you will see that out-of-pocket expenditure does contribute a significant proportion of the overall health expenditure. And uh, this is uh, significantly higher than the regional average. And uh, we see that at a household level, um, households are exposed uh, to these catastrophic and impoverishing costs, uh, particularly for healthcare. And, and, and uh, focusing on vulnerable and low-income households, you see this uh, even more prominent. So the action here we recommend that the government of Uganda expedites the passage of the National Health Insurance uh, Bill uh, to minimize this exposure. There is uh, a lot of discussion going on a bit of back and forth, but we hope that uh, uh, this will uh, eventually see the light of day. Um, and uh, actions should also um, be aimed at supporting households to reduce the out-of-pocket uh, uh, expenditures, which are uh, unacceptably high as it is at the moment. Um, Miria already um, 
uh, hinted on the issue and the impact of illicit uh, financial flows. Um, and, and, and the big figure that uh, you saw, 547 million lost annually to these uh, uh, illicit financial flows. Uh, and this, uh, from our calculations, amounts to 14%, $14 per capita. So we recommend that the government of Uganda um, undertakes a relevant tax reforms to ensure that uh, there is a reduction of these leakages, uh, including tax evasion. Uh, we see quite a bit of uh, waivers, uh, tax exemptions, um, and also capital flight. Uh, from investment, investments that are made uh, within the country. In addition, um, we also recommend that the government expands the tax base. At the moment, the tax base is quite narrow and uh, they should uh, look at tapping into those hard to reach economic activities uh, as well as improve on efficiency of the current uh, administration mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Miria, okay. Um, and finally, um, the use of uh, the development assistance for health uh, needs to be uh, managed more effectively. The issue we see here is that uh, planning and implementation of health services in the country is actually done in uh, silos. And we see this not just between institutions, um, but also um, this is quite evident among the development partners. Development partners have moved away from uh, a sector-wide approach. Uh, we previously had basket funding where um, domestic uh, donors put funds for a sector in one basket, and this was managed as budget support. Um, and this has resulted in fragmentation of development assistance for health. So the actions uh, we are recommending that uh, partners uh, should increase and expand, first of all, on support for the health workforce, as we saw this is uh, underfunded, and include uh, recruitment and salaries as part of the package um, that is currently offered, and do this through more flexible and dependable funding mechanisms. Um, we are advocating very strongly for a return to the sector-wide sector -wide approach um, and move away from uh, the project uh, funding approach that is currently being used. Development partners should also increase um, the share of funds that are channeled uh, through the, uh, through, directly through the budget and also support government in uh, planning for a joint action fund. So um, what have we done um, so far since, we've, since we accomplished uh, the, the study? Um, we have uh, disseminated widely uh, in country within with uh, relevant stakeholders. So first, uh, our first uh, port of call was the Human Resources for Health Technical Working Group at uh, the Ministry of Health. We made uh, present the first presentation here and uh, received valuable feedback uh, that uh, was then uh, uh, used to improve on the report uh, around Within that period, we're also able to disseminate to Parliament of Uganda, specifically to members of the Health Committee of uh, the Parliament of Uganda, and we also received uh, very um, useful feedback that uh, was uh, used to improve on the findings. But uh, uh, important to note here was the uh, Parliament, members of Parliament were received the reports. Uh, and uh, committed to use it as a, as a tool to lobby uh, government for uh, improved uh, allo allocations uh, to the health sector, particularly to the health workforce. Um, we 
appeared for a second time uh, before the HRH Technical Working Group to validate uh, the findings, which was done um, in early October. And uh, on the 29th of uh, January, the report was uh, launched to a wider stakeholder group that uh, brought together uh, the CSO community, donor uh, development partners, uh, the general public, um, and, uh, and, and academia. Um, as a result of the discussions that uh, ensued, um, overall, there was a warm reception of the report, but uh, the issues of the health workforce financing were brought to the fore, and uh, a number of actions uh, were agreed that uh, will be shared hereafter. And uh, finally, in early February, we're invited back to the technical working group of the ministry. As you can see, a lot of interest uh, was picked from this uh, work. And the commitment was then made uh, to use this tool, this report as uh, one of the reference uh, documents in the review of the HRH uh, strategy that is uh, underway. Um, and, uh, that is how far we have gone so far. And I think we and now move on to the next stage of uh, discussing the presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Robert, uh, for, uh, for uh, your part of the presentation. And um, at, at this stage, I would like to invite as a first uh, respondent, Professor Omasra from Manchester, to give some comments on, uh, on our findings in the report so far. And then our colleague from Manchester, Elsie, uh, will also be helping with the moderation of the discussion. So if you have questions, you can write them in the chat or uh, raise your hand, and then I will unmute you and uh, give you the floor. So, Professor, over to you. Hey, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are <laughs> from Uganda, from sunny and uh, beautiful Uganda. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, our partners, Wemos and Miria, for doing this work together with us and uh, for uh, preparing and finalizing this report and convening this webinar. Uh, really, I don't have much to say except in summary to say that um, one, we must not forget that there is a global health workforce crisis. It is the driving factor for the need for this study. And this crisis is going to affect we in the low income countries more mainly because we will not have the resources to employ the health workers that we need. Although we have a lot of young people, if we all invested in education and training. So that is one very important point. And then the rich countries, they have money and they are very likely to uh, recruit from other countries, particularly from low income countries. So there is a strong case for supporting the global code on the international recruitment of health workers so that we share this pool of health workers and more of these studies will help. Number two, um, there's the question in the uh, global strategy 2030, global HRH strategy 2030, there is a, a recommendation there of a threshold of 4.45 physicians, nurses and midwives per thousand population. We've discussed this in this report. We from the South would like to make it clear that the uh, cadres which are being used do not apply to us because many and the foundation of our health systems are not based on doctors, for example. They are based on clinical officers or medical assistants or the allied health workers. And uh, we would like those to be included in a health workforce density ratios. And I, I hope that point will be uh, taken forward. WHO 
endorsed task shifting. There is a, a task shifting strategy uh, which has been endorsed by WHO and these cadres should also be counted when we are talking about uh, uh, health workforce densities. Um, then the, the, uh, there's the question of why is Uganda not spending so much money? On page uh, 19 of the report, I think we didn't show you that slide. It shows you by sector where the budget goes. And many countries in Africa now, we are being told to prioritize on infrastructure, roads, energy, and so on. And that is what Uganda is doing. Because of that, the health budget is suffering stagnation, even deterioration. So we need strong advocacy to get to a situation where investment in infrastructure, yes, 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 but you also need to invest on human capital development, education, and health. And this is a, an advocacy issue which we should all join. And then finally, uh, this question of uh, health workforce planning through multi-sectoral approaches, the country coordination and facilitation approach is critical to achieving our expectations for uh, our health workers who are fit for purpose for every person in every village, uh, everywhere, as J.W. Lee, the former Director General of WHO, used to say. So uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, joining this uh, webinar. Over to you. Thank you very much, Miria and uh, Robert and Professor Maswa for that uh, pre presentation. Would like to hear from the rest of you that have joined. If you have questions and points of discussion, this is the time to give them to us. You are all welcome. I see that Michael Semakula from uh, Uganda has raised uh, his hand. So, Michael, uh, unmute uh, yourself, and we are ready to hear your comment or question. Thank you so much, Miria and the team from Archist. And uh, one of the recommendations, actually, that we should include is uh, having mechanisms, our government designing mechanisms that can cut down the medical tourism that we have in the country, that government officials travel abroad for treatment, and this is actually making the country lose a lot of money. We're almost losing close to three million US dollars. And actually this money might be a little bit higher than that. But since there is not any coordinating and monitoring body that can monitor on who goes out, then it becomes a little bit tricky to establish the real figure that is lost out by the country. And then um, the other one is a question to Archist that, now we have the WHO Global Code of Practice on the international recruitment of health workers. Has Uganda tried to domesticate some of the articles and the guidelines that are in this code, especially on the labor exportation, labor externalization? For instance, with their guidelines on, on compensation, financial and technical compensation, that destination countries can help on the source countries where the uh, the health workers are coming from. Has that been integrated into our domestic policy in regards to the health workforce? Because this could help as well to support our health system and in that regard, the health workforce. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take two more and then uh, have responses. There's one that came in from, um, from Charles about the national health insurance that the president has recalled the bill, would we be knowing why? Okay, so we'll keep that as well. May we have any other discussion points? Uh, maybe we can also put in this uh, group of questions, Elsie, the question about what happens with uh, nurses who are not finding job. Maybe also a chest can give uh, information on that from your uh, study in uh, mobility of health workers. So we can start with these three yes. comments and questions. 
So maybe Ache's team, uh, you have uh, more information on um, the health insurance bill being recalled. Should we start with that? Uh, we have also heard that this bill has been uh, recalled. It's not moving much. It's uh, in Parliament, uh, but we do not have the details. And nevertheless, I think those of us who are interested in this agenda uh, should continue uh, to talk about it, uh, to make proposals to the government so that uh, it, uh, it, it picks up momentum. All right. Thank you. And uh, then um, you asked uh, on the, Santos, you asked on the chat about uh, the nurses who are not um, recruited. So we have seen, and maybe I just can give more information on that as well, that there is um, brain drain, so nurses leaving the country, either to high income countries in, um, in, uh, uh, outside Africa or uh, in other countries uh, within Africa, so regional or international movement, or even a uh, change of, uh, of sectors. Um, I don't know if I just want to give more details on that. The common situation in most African countries, you have a situation where you have a budget, where you have uh, uh, vacancies, but also you have unemployed health workers, exactly. particularly the women, uh, uh, with nursing. This, you remember, uh, uh, this uh, Amelia told us in the presentation that in uh, the financial year 2017-2018, Uganda did not spend uh, almost $4 million of wage bill, and it was returned to the treasury. This revolves around management of health workers, their recruitment and decentralization, which hands over responsibility for recruitment to districts, and they have had to advertise, and uh, some districts are unpopular, and so on. So the, to me, one of the key, key things, if we are going to improve health workforce in Africa, is to strengthen management. Each Ministry of Health should have a strong uh, a human resources for health development, including those management uh, uh, aspects, are uh, the files complete and so on, but even more important, ensuring that the disease burden is met by skills, skills that respond to the disease burden in numbers. That's why the CCF is also important, so that we bring all the ministries together uh, to plan for this. So that really is uh, the reason why we have this. Migration is taking place. And in Uganda, I think that question was asked also on the court. Uh, the Ministry of uh, Gender, Labor, and Social Development in Uganda has actually got a statute which uh, uh, enables uh, externalization of labor. It is at the moment used mainly for domestic workers who go to the Middle East, security guards, but it can also be used for health workers. And Uganda and other African countries should start to use the code to negotiate bilateral agreements with the high income countries so that these resources can be shared in a just way, just to the health workers, and also just to the countries, both, both ways. There's also the question about the nurses, if they are not employed by, by the public sector, if they can be employed elsewhere, given a chance. As it was uh, talked about earlier, we, this, this study focused on the public sector. But the private sector contributes a lot, as well as the not-for-profit sector. So nurses and other health workers are actually free to, to contribute in the private sector and the not-for-profit sector. Um, in response to the question on uh, domestication of the WHO uh, court, um, 
Uganda does report uh, periodically to uh, WHO on uh, status of the health workforce. This is one of the um, one one of the requirements uh, in uh, implementation of the board regularly um, updating the status and reporting uh, on the status of inflows uh, of uh, health workforce. Um, the issue of uh, of uh, bi bilateral agreements between source uh, and destination countries okay. is an area that uh, needs to be uh, worked on. Um, as it is, we don't have many, we, we don't have much to talk about in terms of uh, actual agreements that have been signed with uh, source destination countries uh, and uh, there is need uh, for emphasis here. African uh, uh, agreements. Um, uh, Namibia has an agreement with Kenya. South Africa has also some, an agreement with uh, a number of other countries. Uh, Sudan, the Republic of Sudan, has an agreement with a uh, number of countries in the Middle East. Uh, so it is, it is starting, and uh, there are more negotiations which I hear about in that field. We need to talk more about it and uh, let it be better known that uh, the code is available. Mm -hmm. There's a question about the methodology that the workers are, were not included among the stakeholders interviewed. And I can the, take that. Okay, please go ahead. So uh, thank you, Evelyn, for the question. In the interviews, we included uh, the Ugandan Medical Association. So we talked with uh, the president at the time and uh, others from the association. So yes, we talked with representatives from the health workers, uh, but uh, indeed we didn't go to the field to speak with nurses or midwives at that stage. Uh, but there is a lot of experience from our partners at CHEST when it comes to experiences from the ground uh, in health workers. So that was the reason we were only limited in the, in the representatives of them at that stage. Thank uh, you, we, we have uh, three raised hands, Elsie. Could we hmm. take them one by one? Yes, please. Yes, so, I see, um, uh, I will give by order of appearance. Uh, first, it was uh, Thomas, Thomas Swartz, who raised his hand. So, Thomas, over to you. Yes, yeah, thanks. <coughs> Congratulations for the report and also for the success to feed some of mm -hmm. the recommendations back to the government. I think that they, they listen to you and that's okay. I'm a bit worried about <clears throat> how to feed back recommendations to the so-called development partners and donors, and how the yeah how this is related uh, to solving the problem. Um, what happened exactly in that moment when the, the the government disengaged from investing in the health sector and all those donors stepped in? I think it was also the moment when there was a lot of money available for the MDGs. And this led to vertical programs, projects, uh, donor controls, money spending. And what happened with the sector-wide approach? Uh, Uganda was a kind of, a, well, you invented it, or it was invented in Uganda. And why is it not possible to reconstruct it based on the need or on, the, on, the, on, on rational arguments and on, on a call? To, to, to donors to overcome the rhetorics of aligning their work with the government policies, but doing it. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, what's, what's, happen what's happening there? And, and do, you, do you plan to get, engage with the international community, which should play an important role in this picture? Thank you. OK. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I'm sure that. Uh, a chest has a lot of experience with uh, with the donor environment so far. From our side, we saw in this indeed this high dependency and this uh, fragmentation between donors. So 
from our side, of course, uh, highlighting these findings to international development uh, partners is going to be key. Uh, depend, uh, on the story about how the government disengaged and partners came in, maybe, uh, Aches, do you have any historical memory on, uh, on that from your side? on how did uh, the environment became as is at the moment? Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Kadama, who is uh, here, uh, together with me, we were virtually the architects of the sector-wide uh, approaches program in Uganda. That 20 years ago or more. And uh, it, uh, it certainly worked well. We also had a very strong uh, Minister of Finance uh, and uh, they were the ones who were really leading and imposing the, the swap. And it worked very well, and it will work very well. What I think has happened is uh, 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 the stewardship and uh, the uh, hurry of donors to get results when they don't come as soon as they want them is what has led us, not just in Uganda, but in most countries, to this fragmentation, and it's not good. So uh, Thomas, I would like to uh, request you to join us and mobilize other people. Why don't we make a campaign to return to swaps, a global campaign? Uh, because we now have these global health initiatives, the likes of Gavi and the Global Fund and World Bank Malaria and et cetera, the, 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 the money for development assistance went up quite a bit. I think it may be stagnated now, but let's launch a campaign on returning to swaps, both for donors as well as for our governments. Also weakness of the government. If the government does not show the donor results, then they try and do it for themselves. So we also need a, a campaign here in uh, Africa to get our governments to uh, work uh, in such a way that they build the trust of the donors. One of the things which has been introduced because of uh, a weakness of SOPs is what they call results-based financing. That's just a reaction to frustration. And I personally uh, do not believe that it's the way forward uh, because there are people who cook up results and this and it's also another way of fragmentation. It does not build an integrated health system. So that's my proposal. Let's uh, launch a campaign. To return, uh, re let's return to source. Great. Um, um, we only have, uh, sorry, I'll see. We only have uh, five minutes left. So I'm going to quickly answer one question from uh, Mitt, that I see, Mitt Phillips from MSF uh, Belgium that I see on the chat about the um, national health insurance and the out-of-pocket expenses and our expectation. So uh, indeed, it is uh, based also on assuming crop subsidy because at the moment, only 5% of the people in Uganda are insured, this is what we found in uh, the literature, and also only 11% of them are aware of health insurance in general. So it doesn't mean that by expediting the insurance bill, automatically out of pocket is going to be reduced. It will be just a step towards that uh, direction. And, uh, Thank you for, uh, for your comment about the perverse effect that we often see in such cases. Uh, I think it's very important to have, this, uh, to have this in mind. I'm sorry, I'm answering very quickly, but it's, it's a very good comment and uh, we can discuss a lot about it. Um, and then uh, I think I will take, we have two hands up. If you can be very, very quick, so we can answer very, very quickly. Marco, you were first, Marco Angelo. So please um, make your comment. Yeah. Um, hello, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, my question was mainly about the role of the private sector, both profit and non-profit, 
um, um, is there a shortage of health workers there and um, are they also a pulling factor for the public sector? Um, I wanted some, yeah, uh, some clarification about that. Okay, thank you. And I will also take the last question from Baba Aye, who also has the hand raised. Please uh, give us quickly your question. Are you there? Maybe in the meantime, we could rest. Yeah, yeah, I, I forgot to unmute. I'm, 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 okay, okay. So quite quickly, uh, it, it's twofold. One, the importance and centrality uh, of involvement of uh, the trade unions of social dialogue in the process of uh, uh, health, um, expanding health em employment as uh, the Working for Health uh, resolution of the World Health Assembly two years back um, uh, noted that I mean, it, it is not something to add on uh, uh, at some subsequent stage, but is actually uh, at the point of departure. And uh, that way we're talking only, not only of uh, in expanding health employment, but also of decent work. Uh, and uh, the second aspect, because what always comes up, the question of funding, uh, I, I, we, we, we think that there's the need to look uh, into uh, tax systems, the need to look into, uh, because this is, while this, uh, inside of uh, Uganda, and for which we commend Arches and Wemos for an excellent work done, is very important. It's part of a broader uh, rubric uh, in, in Africa, despite the commitment in what uh, next year would be 20 years of the Abuja Declaration. There's the need to stress uh, um, that African government needs to realize, I mean, um, expenditure on health is not some, some cost, but an investment and should be able to uh, structure um, um, fiscal commitment to placing the necessary money required into building strong public health systems. Thank you. Thank you for that. So um, I might ask everyone to, to stay for a couple of more minutes. Uh, so quickly on the question about the private sector, if there is shortage there as well, as far as I know there is, we didn't focus on the private sector in this, uh, in this report and in this research, but this is a topic that we could do a whole new exercise upon. And if they pull from the public sector, uh, I just team correct me if I'm wrong, but we have seen pulling from the private sector, is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Elsie. Any comments on, uh, on the comment about uh, trade and health employment? Well, uh, thank you, my brother. Uh, uh, on that point of decent work and the unions and so on, they are part of the equation. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the in this particular study, the Uganda Medical Association was part of it, and um, the future is in uh, health workers who are able to bargain for themselves, empowered to do so, and also holding their employers and their governments to account. And the private sector is going to be increasing in importance. There are so many private hospitals coming up all over Africa, particularly targeting universal health coverage and the health insurance that's advocated with it. So it will become more and more important to strengthen regulation and the oversight of uh, the private sector. But it's there can become an opportunity for uh, uh, employment, decent jobs for health workers. Great. All right. Well, um, it's already two minutes past two, so we are just on time. I think we managed to answer uh, most of the questions. There is a last one from Angela about how to implement the update of the HRH staffing norms. From our side, of course, we also push that with this recommendation to the next HRH national strategy. 
So we are waiting to see if it's going to be updated by then, but I'm sure Arches team will follow closely on that recommendation because it was one of our key problems, uh, one of the key problems that we, ident we identified. So thank you for, uh, for highlighting it. And uh, with this, um, I would like to thank you all for being here, for actively participating and uh, asking questions and making comments. Uh, the report and the shorter version we called Advocacy Brief are available on our uh, platforms. If there is anything else that you would like to ask, you can always email us and we are happy to answer further questions. Use the report, use the Advocacy Brief in your work as well. It's out there for like-minded CSOs and organizations. And we are looking forward to using it uh, in the future. So thank you all. Uh, Robert, you can uh, close with any final remarks. Yes. Um, uh, our next steps now, obviously, is to utilize the, this document as a tool for advocacy. We will continue to um, disseminate to various fora to engage uh, and, and also to build the momentum uh, that will, uh, at the end of the day, see an improvement in the financing of uh, the health workforce. In the, process of in the process of validation and dissemination to date, we received a lot of uh, suggestions of new strands that we could take to investigate uh, further issues of uh, financing. And uh, um, one of them obviously is uh, looking at the private uh, health sector. Um, in terms of manpower, this one uh, contributes anywhere at the region of 40% of the health workforce um, in Uganda. So it would be interesting to um, apply the interrogation that we have done to the public sector to include the private uh, sector. So look <coughs> at the other suggested areas. We are open to uh, partnerships to do further research in the various areas. It's been a pleasure working with uh, all stakeholders, all those that uh, contributed to this uh, piece of work in terms of views, in terms of uh, secondary uh, materials, we, uh, uh, we do appreciate uh, your input. And of course, uh, to Miria and the team at Wemos, uh, this has been uh, a very informative uh, process and uh, we look forward to more partnerships of this nature. Thank you. So thank you everyone uh, for being here with us and looking forward for um, future engagements. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.